And we are joined now by Garrett Bruhag, a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester. And he is here to explain the latest breakthrough in fusion energy and what it really means. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, happy to come on and explain it. Um, thanks. For, yeah. I guess, where do you want me to jump in? <laughs> so I, I was explaining to him briefly while we were uh, setting up his shot. I'm a, I'm a science philistine in many respects. When I, when I read about this, I was incredibly excited, right? Where like the mainstream media reports on, on the, uh, this fusion reaction were, were glowing. Um, government scientists have achieved this, this massive breakthrough. Can, can you explain what that means for our audience? And then we can go through kind of some of the more practical realities. Yeah, so I guess going all the way back, nuclear fusion is one of the two big nuclear reactions that we can use to get energy. Fission is what we use right now in reactors. It's where we split something heavy like uranium. Uh, my lights are actually currently being kept on by a fission reactor, so I'm glad that works. Uh, fusion is what we would like to uh, have in the future, um, and maybe for like space and things like that. It's what powers the sun. Uh, and it's also what powers hydrogen bombs, which is part of the impetus for research on it. Um, what happened at Lawrence Livermore National Labs last week is they achieved what we call ignition. You can argue they actually did it last year, but this year was the real uh, official uh, set point. There was There's what us scientists would consider, and there's what the government set as a solid bar to make sure that there was no uh, games being played. And you can think of it like this. Uh, imagine we have a, like a bonfire we want to light, right? And we have some sort of new kind of super clean burning wood that we want to use. And we know from our, our young and youthful and crazy days setting off nuclear bombs that if we use a flamethrower, we can light the bonfire. But that's not really useful. That's, that's dangerous and bad. <laughs> the goal was to figure out how to light just a little bit of it in a very controlled fashion. And what we did last week was show that we could get a little bit of it to burn with more energy, to release more energy than it took to actually light it. And we've been working on this for 60 years. The fuel was able to self heat. Now it did not actually make more energy than was totally put into the system. The electricity to charge the lasers was far more than the energy that the fusion uh, reaction put out but the fusion reaction put out more energy than the lasers put in. And that's what we really care about for understanding the physics. We've never done that outside of the nuclear weapon before. And it is huge to be able to do it inside of the lab. It allows us to study what actually happens in an ignited plasma, which is a really big deal for making any kind of fusion reactor. But we also know from our crazy youthful days that you can scale this up quite quickly. So just, you know, once you get a little bit of wood burning, you know, you can get a lot of wood burning uh, without too much more effort. It was just figuring out how to light it. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how surprising was this breakthrough? What had this, I mean, you talk about how they've been working on this since, um, for decades, since what, the 1950s on, on, on fusion, uh, and, and they finally had this, this massive breakthrough, but in terms of how this was building, was this expected or uh, surprising? So it was both surprising and expected. And I'll, I'll explain why I use those two terms. Uh, the facility where this happened, the National Ignition Facility, you'll notice the ignition is in the name. They got that funded and it was proposed that we understood fusion so well from all of our nuclear weapons testing that we could just build this big laser and it was just going to work. That there were claims when they were getting this thing built uh, back in like the early 2000s. The very first shot was going to make so much fusion, it would damage the facility. And it, it was going to be just the most beautiful and amazing scientific achievement. Well, they started up in 2008, I want to say. And you'll notice they didn't get it. <laughs> and it's been many years, many very embarrassing years of having a facility called the National Ignition Facility with no ignited plasma. Now, this most recent shot was, it was expected that we were going to get something like this soon, because last year in August, we had a surprise shot that got so much more yield than we were expecting. It did actually cause some damage. It did not pass the government threshold for ignition, but all of us in the field were like, oh my God, we did it. We're, we know how to go from here. Um, so it was kind of just a matter of time. And an important thing to keep in mind is that the National Ignition Facility takes a really long time to set up all these experiments. 
So we're not, it's not like we're shooting these pellets once every minute and be like, why aren't they lighting? Why aren't they lighting? There's maybe 10 really high yield fusion experiments per year. The laser is used for other things. It's uh, it's used for national security related applications and it's also used for pure science. There's a lot of really amazing studies of things like white dwarfs and centers of planets and cool like astrophysics and all of that takes time where they could be doing fusion. So the fact that they went from nothing, almost no fusion yield at all, to getting up, 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 getting a surprise shot, and then this uh, ignition moment, it is a pretty impressive feat. It was over the course of, I think, 300 times they pulled the trigger on a fusion shot. It's it's pretty pretty few to be iterating. Now, um, the this kind this laser or this technology, I guess, uh, at the at the NIF, um, I, I saw in your Twitter thread on this that there there's it's a bit outdated to a degree. And there's going to be an issue potentially now, especially with the Republicans taking the House, uh, with maybe getting some funding to capitalize on some of this technological achievement. Where is it a little where is it behind where it should be to continue some of the 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 experimentation that you describe? So all big science machines tend to be surprisingly old in terms of the technology used. We have to pick what is um, safe at the time, right? You have to pick a technology that you trust you can build this multi-billion dollar machine uh, taking taxpayer money and that it will actually work. So NIF, the, the NIF was commissioned in 1992 to begin construction. So they are decided to use laser technology from say 1982. So this is before we even get, you know, uh, Ronnie Ray guns, Star Wars program pushing lasers forward. Um, we had better laser technology at smaller scale. No one was going to fund it for, for the NIF. The point was just to make the darn thing work. It didn't matter how inefficient and bad it was. It would it just need to put lasers on target. We've had many decades of wonderful advancement. Uh, both on civilian and military sides, and also um, for fusion applications, the lasers are looking a lot better. The que- Like you said, though, the question is going to be funding to actually get a new facility built. There's already serious talk of proposals of new facilities where I'm at in Rochester, where we have the little sister to the NIF, um, as well as facilities moving past the National Ignition Facility. I actually think we are in a better boat than you would expect politically. And that's because the NIF is connected to military applications as well because of stockpile Mm. stewardship. You can usually convince the Republicans to jump on board for that sort of stuff. Um, You just kind of wave your hands and say military and then you you can get you can get your money for whatever science you want to do. It happened during the Reagan era. There was a lot of this will totally defend us from the Soviets and it, it wasn't it was worthless for that. Um, but it's all about playing the, the smart political games and fusion is hot right now. We've got, you mm. know, there's, there's talk of clean energy. There's talk of an energy crisis and everyone wants to push forward on it. So I, I think, I think we are liable to get new facilities that can really build off of it. Timelines are always the question and, you know, who knows, maybe someone, someone like, um, uh, what's his face, Ted Cruz or whatever does a poison pill. Who knows? Let's hope not, um, because, uh, yeah, all we just have to say is military, as you say, but don't say it too loud because then it's, it's given it away. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm wondering if you could expand a bit more on the, uh, the, the, the reason that this, if it's able to be advanced, this kind of technology would be so beneficial for uh, moving towards a future where our energy systems are not contributing to, say, the destruction of the planet, um, the the a- amount of, or, or I guess this is a really just to uh, move away from carbon uh, uh, carbon intensive energy, right? Um, what is the what does it really mean in terms of our fight uh, to reduce the effects of climate change? So. My honest opinion on it is that fusion is probably not hitting at the time frame we we really need. I mean, it's one of those things we should always be pushing new technologies forward. We want to have new stuff coming online as much as possible. 
but we also need to be deploying things now. So you kind of have to weigh that mix. Now, of course, the amount of money going into fusion research really is nothing compared to, uh, say, the IRA um, bill. Where the, the NIF was built over budget at $3.5 billion over the course of 15 years. That's a drop in the bucket. Um, and, and we could build newer facilities in that sort of time frame. Fusion is completely carbon free. So that's very nice. Uh, it has, it's basically got all of the attributes of nuclear fission power. It's just a different way of getting nuclear energy. It's going to take a while to get reactors that make uh, net electricity. And then if you read up on the history of say how we got fission reactors to where they are now, it's going to take a while to get them to be reliable and cheap and things that we, that we can really um, use to, to plug uh, big parts of our power so power usage. Um, but if you don't start now, you'll never get there. And right. it's, it, it is a really compelling way forward. Um, and it's, it's one of those beautiful things that the, even though it technically burns fuel, the fuel that's burnt, I mean, I got enough in my glass of water to already power the, the city I'm living in for many, many years. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful future energy source. And so it's definitely something, especially because we have this um, this big advancement and then broadly in the United States, kind of a lead in fusion technology, we shouldn't give up on it, even if it's not going to come onto the grid next year. Well, uh, what is the waste that would be produced by this process? Um, broadly, the waste issue would come down to activated materials. So fusion makes a lot more neutron radiation than fission and it will make the walls of the reactor radioactive. Uh, this is an issue that we already deal with with medical waste and with fission uh, reactors. It's a known problem, um, just like handling, and, and just like handling waste from a fission reactor, it's an incredibly small amount of t material, all things considered. You look at a fusion reactor and say, wow, that's huge. But then you consider how much energy it made. Uh, it's a minuscule amount of waste. We're already working on how you would recycle it. And it would be um, dangerous for less time than fission waste. Although, you know, you can recycle fission waste and make that not an issue either. It's kind of, it's one of those things that if you put the regulatory bodies in place and the correct incentives, it's not even a problem. Oh, I'm praying that this continues to be in the government's hands and there isn't like some sort of like a private push. I mean, would that even be possible uh, it, it, currently for, for there is, would, would that worry you? Yeah. So there is a big private push right now on fusion. That's where a lot of the money is coming in. Um, the exciting part is a lot of these companies are pushing ideas. The, the government has to kind of just pick a couple safe concepts and push them forward because you're using taxpayer money. Um, these companies are more likely to go for some wild concepts that might might pay off. I can't say if they're going to work. Who knows? I, I think it's great if they keep taking, say, Jeff Bezos's money and playing with it. You know, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm not that worried about any sort of safety concerns, though. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is fame, which is the, the people that regulate all of this. They're famously harsh in the United States. Um, we have very, very well regulated uh, nuclear activities already. And I don't think there would be any risk when it comes to fusion. Um, the NRC will prevent any uh, issues to the to the public. Good. Well, at least it, in its current iteration, right? Unless this begins to explode and then there's maybe some deregulatory push, but uh, we, we can cross that bridge when, when, when we come to it. Um, does, does that, does when you when you talk about fission um technology is that what a lot of the uh, old climate models for a transition to nuclear are based on and does that make um fission more outdated now that we have these new gains in fusion so that's basically what every climate model talking about using nuclear would, would assume um, because we we hadn't even hit ignition. So no one knew when fusion would come online. We're still a long ways from a power plant. And so all of those climate models assuming fission are very, very um, on point. And there is no guarantee a fusion power plant or any near term one is at all um, competitive. And I don't mean in a market-based sense, but in like making cheap, reliable power for, for everyone. 
Uh, current fission reactors are already really good. The, the ones that we want and are building are even better. And uh, I, I would very much push people, even though this is, this is an amazing thing to be excited about, it's awesome that we hit this point and we should keep pushing forward on fusion. In no way should we give up on fission. We should push fission forward. We should push the, you know, the accelerator to the max because it is a proven way to decarbonize huge chunks of, of economies as seen with France and Ontario. All right. Well, um, that was so helpful, and I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Garrett Bruhog, PhD candidate, University of Rochester. You got a Twitter f- thread where you go into this, and uh, people can check out your your page. We'll put a link to it in our description for the podcast. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. It was great. Thank you.